Hi, and welcome to this year's National Mills Weekend 2020. Come and join us as we celebrate Britain's milling heritage. This year's theme is Mills and Millwriting, and we have exclusive interviews with two millwrights. But we can't forget the mills themselves, and you have kindly sent in some glorious examples of your mill up and down the country, and those are coming up throughout the show. But first, I'd like to hand over to Mildred Cookson, Chair of the SPAB's Mills section, for a little bit of background to this year's event. Hello, and what a very different National Mills Weekend this one's going to be. Due to the coronavirus, of course, we can't get out, and the mills themselves are not being open because they can't be manned by volunteers or anyone. The only mills that are working are those that are actually producing flour for the coronavirus, which is brilliant, and they're all working overtime, those that can do it. So I hope this film goes a little bit of the way to help you see some mills that perhaps you wouldn't have seen, um, not only from distance-wise, but also um, we hope that non-members will see it as well and encourage them to go and look at mills and make them realise that these important structures are really part of our heritage and very, very special. Thank you and keep safe, everyone. When you go into the supermarket and buy your loaf of bread, sometimes the packaging has the symbol of an old traditional windmill on it. However, it is unlikely that the flour used in that bread came from such a mill. Today, there are still, across the UK, water and windmills that do grind in the old traditional ways. And I'm going to speak to one such miller, Jim Bailey of Heckington Mill. What's it like being a miller? It's very special. Ha having learned how to operate um, the only working eight cell windmill in the world of its type, it's been a pleasure and, and an honour, really, to, to be able to operate it um, and to teach people uh, what little I know, as people have taught me, and it will go on. Uh, I'm, I'm nearly 70 now, so uh, my active time at windmill will reduce. Um, and younger people will come in behind me, but that's just part of being um, in an organisation that looks after heritage buildings. Be being the, the, the miller, my, my primary task, of course, is to provide flour for our shop to sell. We always use grain that's grown locally to us. We, we, we have a strap line that says it has to be grown within the site of the town. And that's what we do. We keep about a ton in the tower itself. We mill when we need flour for the shop. Um, clearly, once the grain lasts for effectively for a long time, but as soon as we mill it into flour, it has a shelf life. We give the six month shelf life. So we mill by demand. Once the mill is running and running smoothly, I can move around a little bit. And I like to have somebody else then take over on the tentering screw to, uh, to ensure the quality of the flour is right and stay there. And we would normally try to mill about three to 400 kilos of, of flour. And we're fortunate we've got um, a selection of stones. We've got two sets of Derbyshire grit stones for whole meal, although I keep one of those for milling barley for brewing. Um, as we have a brewery on site. So um, whole meal and then one set of French stones, um, which obviously we use for white flour. We also have a stone, uh, a pair of uh, millstones mounted in a hearse frame, which are driven by an old Ruston engine, which allows us to mill whole meal flour on non-windy days as well. And in truth, that's been an absolute godsend because it has allowed us to mill um, independent of the wind when we need to do that. Can you describe the noise, uh, maybe the smell, the, the sights that's actually going on while the sails are turning? I mean, th that old saying, um, nose to the grindstone, is very true because I mill by sound. I stand below the stones and I can hear the grinding ab above me. So I'm using my ears to listen to that um, sight, of course. I'm, I'm looking at the flower coming from the chute, feel, um, 
the rule of thumb where, where the miller uh, runs the grate in, in his hand and runs his thumb across his palm to feel the coarseness or the fineness of the flower and, and the bran within it. And I'm using that sense as well. But also my nose, I'm using the sense of smell because I can smell the, uh, the, the flower being ground. And of course, if for some reason I don't have sufficient feed of grain going between the stones, all the stones, there's too much pressure on the stones, you can smell, uh, I describe it as an iron smell. Heating. Um, you know, the flower is overheating and it damage the flower, you give a taint to it. So you do have that sense of smell as well. So all of those senses together gives you the skill to mills. Um, of course, I'm also listening to, to the machinery as well, to, to, the, uh, to the shaft turning um, and the, the gearing engaging and listening for something that doesn't sound right, where I know I'd have to either shut down the mill or at least go and investigate. Um, and then we mill um, as, as much as we need. Um, to mill um, at three, four hundred kilos it's going to take um, several hours and um, we, we normally um, we'd normally mill for two to three hours maybe yeah maybe a little bit longer um, stop when we've got enough we stop and then clean down as much as we can secure the mill um, that's the life of a miller do you have to do more than active maintenance to the mill yes yeah, so perhaps a little bit of background um, Heckington windmill has been owned by three milling families, which is not many, um, given that it was um, built in 1830. But um, the, the last milling family sold the mill tower to the local council in uh, the late 1940s. Um, uh, that's now the county council that, that owns it, and we lease it from them. So while we own the, the buildings and the land that surrounds the tower itself, um, we don't actually own the tower. So the major maintenance is carried out by Lincolnshire County Council, which we are obviously very, very grateful that they do that. Um, so the amount of maintenance we do is day-to-day -day servicing, greasing, um, and minor maintenance and repairs, things that we can do which are well within our capability of doing, but clearly um, the big stuff, no, that, that's, that's carried out by, by, by the council. Do you think in that case that there is a future for mills like Heckington, especially as they're run by volunteers? Yes, I, I, I believe that there is a future. Going through this period where the mills are closed, um, getting the mill back up again and working isn't just a matter of mechanics, of uh, of cleaning down, um, oiling and greasing and checking through machinery before we get it going again. But it's also about the people. The people, the most important part of it is getting them to happy to volunteer again, one, to give their time, but also to give their time and work in a safe environment. And I, I, I hope that other windmills and, and ourselves to, to an extent, um, when we start to bring the volunteers back in again, we can get back to where we were. Will it ever be exactly the same again? Who knows? Melon to Gwent is a working woollen mill near Fishguard in Wales. The Griffiths family originally bought the mill in 1912 and have been weaving there ever since. Producing traditional Welsh textiles, water power originally drove the machinery and today the original water wheel has been lovingly restored. It would have run uh, the carding machines, which were machines that combed the wool and they ran directly off the wheel. So we just had the big leather belts operating pulleys that operated more belts that were then fixed to the carding machine. So when the wheel moved, the rollers on the carding machine moved. The reason that it stopped wasn't so much the wheel as the fact that we got rid of the machines that could be powered directly off the wheel. When I came here it was turning but it wasn't actually working and over time it, um, it started clunking and dropping and generally starting to be a lot more dangerous and that's why we had to stop using it. We were very much pushed by Paul and uh, he kept nagging us to make a start 
and he eventually managed to find people who had the capacity to do the kind of steel work that we needed to repair the pieces that were completely damaged. Everything that's cast is the original wheel, the centre sprockets and the two circles which make the wheel. Sectionally, it's in six. Even the segments of six apiece are heavy. It's a two-man job. I made the spokes at home in my garage. I laid the whole wheel out in the garage floor before laying it in here. Well, the sprocket itself has obviously been handmade because not one hole matches up with the next sprocket spoke along. They're all different. Yeah, last mm -hmm. In the last hole. It's quite smooth, isn't it? The buckets were made of mild steel. They're now made of core 10, the same as the Angel of the North. It's high in carbon, apparently. It's supposed to rust and stay that way and not go in holes. 100 years time, we'll know the answer. I think the idea was to take what we had and do the best with it, make new parts where we absolutely had to. But the real driving force behind it was to get it to work again so that we could harness the power of the water long term and maybe think about using it for generating power, perhaps in a slightly different way to the way it was originally intended, but nevertheless getting it restored just because it's worth it, and then secondly, being able to do something useful with it. It doesn't look massive, because you only see half of it out of here. There's 50 inches actually buried in the wall. And we've had a look at the old photographs, and within a few inches at the most, it's back in what we can see as the same place. Even this, which looks like it's sticking out a bit too much here, is the same in the old one. So if we found that it was shooting the water too far forward, just cut it off. It's a magic thing to have. There are very few internal wheels in the country and very few internal overshot wheels in the country. And I think we were just very conscious that it's part of the history of the mill and uh, we needed to do something about it. I think there were a lot of times when we just thought we couldn't see light at the end of the tunnel, but it is there now and it's, it's absolutely really exciting, fantastic, lovely to see. I love the fact that Water is one of those simple elements, and harnessing water is what powered the whole of the Industrial Revolution. And the fact that we've got a piece of that history here and that we've brought it back to life, I think is absolutely fantastic. It's going to be great for us, and I think really great for visitors to come and see. Coming up, we talk to the millwright Ian Clark and have a look at Oldland Windmill. But first, we go to York. Holgate Windmill is a tower mill, situated in the hamlet of Holgate, on the outskirts of York, originally surrounded by wheat fields, although now unusually situated on a roundabout in a small housing estate. In 2001, the Holgate Windmill Preservation Society was formed, and with the help of dedicated volunteers, the mill is now restored to fully working order, grinding grain to sell locally when the wind permits. One interesting fact is that a wooden main shaft from around 1770, when the mill was built, is probably made from an old ship's mast. The surrounding area was used for ship repairs, so it's quite possible that a redundant mast found its way into the mill. So my name's uh, Ian Clark, and I run a company called Ian Clark Restoration, and we're based in uh, in Hampshire, Winchester, Hampshire. I I got my passion from my father, who was a, a marine marine chief engineer. My grandfather was also at sea, 
and all my ancestors were bricklayers, worked in foundries, made steam engines, made bridges. Um, it's in my DNA. You know, I can't, I can't get out of it. It, 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 it defines me. It's my blueprint. Um, but I went to steam, en steam engine rallies in the very, in the very, in the early 1960s, and I was just captivated by. I guess just engineering in motion, poetry in motion, the things that work, that's what, you know, that's what I enjoy. How would you define a millwright? The, the term millwright as we, as we know it today um, is mostly used in, in the heritage industry because millwriting has gone from what is actually, has been for 200 years, a commercial profession uh, because of the demise of wind and water mills, traditional milling as we know it, um, and we moved into more, you know, into roller milling in the 1880s, 1890s. Um, the, the mill writing today is, the mill rights working today are supporting the heritage industry, whether it be a privately owned mill, whether it be a council owned mill, whether it be English Heritage National Trust. But mill rights are mostly working in that niche heritage market. The most significant change that mill rights have seen in what has now become the sort of cultural heritage era is that we are often working for very, very um, informed, very discerning clients like English Heritage National Trust, where their whole remit is underwritten by a care and a continuity of collections. And there's far more, under, far larger understanding now of the importance of original material. And so mill rights today, as well as other people working in the, in, in the heritage sector, have to embrace a far broader approach to their work, including a very clear understanding, a very clear ethical understanding of what they're doing. So any job that we take on we would have a we'd have a very clear and a very honest open conversation dialogue with the client to try and flesh out what what is required would would that just be down to say um for instance money or would it be down to aesthetics or would it be down to other reasons there's very important points you make there um for instance um we would always try to deploy and use traditional skills traditional methods and additional materials where possible. So if a job requires a piece of oak to be replaced, we would use English oak where possible. Um, if we had a casting that was missing to complete a, a complete a project, we would make traditional patterns. We'd have them cast at a foundry. We would machine them. We wouldn't necessarily like to produce a modern welded fabrication because it's never going to look right. And I believe if at all possible, if, if the money is available and uh, it's, it's possible to produce something traditionally, it should be done. There are compromises to be had. As you just said, there are compromises to be had. Um, if you're replacing, if you're, if you're rebuilding uh, an entire water wheel and you might have to use 5,000 fixings to hold the buckets on, um, if traditionally those fixings were three eight Whitworth uh, square heads, uh, you can't buy those. You can't buy those today. You can make them at a premium. So, with a discussion with the client, and this is a very simple discussion, you can say, "Well, we can put back like for like for X amounts of pounds, or you can buy ten mil off the shelf with hexagon heads." wrought iron in the traditional sense as a material science, not as a, a descriptive term for decorative ironwork, but wrought iron as a, as a pure material. Um, it's not made anymore. Um, moreover, it has, it has ceased to become a British standard material. So there is no British standard for it. So if you're doing, if you're doing a, a project that has very heightened health and safety issues, public safety issues, structural strength issues, all things like this, and you're being asked to, to uh, repair something or replace something or replicate something, and you're condoning using material that actually uh, is unclassified. Uh, quite difficult to get that through the structural engineering process. Um, but we would still say that ethically, as traditional mill rights and 
for us working in the industrial heritage uh, sector, our responsibility, our obligation to our collections care and our ethical approach to our work we, we, and to our clients is to always, where we can possibly, uh, deploy traditional skills and traditional materials. Um, millwrights will have a very well-informed opinion of what should be done, what could be done, what might be done, how it could be done. They work out the end game, whether you want to make flour, whether it's just a cosmetic or aesthetic conservation job, of which there's value as well. Because if you, uh, for instance, the National Trust own a, a, a pure Georgian mill, which is predominantly timber construction, they don't operate it simply because the risk is too high. They don't want to lose that original material. Um, so there's that, that comes into the mix as well. You, you probably know heritagecrafts.org uh, with the Prince of Wales's patron. Um, they've got a red list of dying crafts and mill writing is on this list. Um, how do you see mill writing in that aspect? Mill writing is not just endangered. It's critically endangered and has been since 2019 when it entered the red list. But I was just recapping on what they say. So, you know, critically endangered are, are, are skills uh, that are at serious risk of no longer being practiced in the UK. Well, I think currently there might be up to 10 of us working across the UK as, as trying to earn a living as, as a millwright. Um, they also include craft skills with a shrinking, uh, the shrinking base of craft people. So, yes, we are disappearing and we're all getting on. There's no question. Uh, we're all of a certain age uh, where it won't be long before we can't even pick up our tools. Um, endangered, we're crossed with limited training opportunities. Now, the SBAB are doing, doing fantastic work with their training bursary for mill rights. Um, it would be wonderful to think if we could ramp that up, if we could um, offer more opportunities. Um, Endangered means we're crafts with, which have low financial viability. Well, us as a company, um, to, be, to be completely honest, we could not survive on mill writing alone. Um, we, we embrace the opportunities that come our way, but those opportunities are scarce. Um, we've been riding a crest of a wave of heritage conservation since, I guess, the 1950s onwards. You know, your Rex Wales, Frank Gregory's, all these fantastic people back in the day were going around recording mill sites. They were already saying, oh, there's another smock mill, there's another post mill, another tower mill, another water mill, derelict. You know, that dawning of the 50s and 60s where industrial heritage conservation took off. It was just a passion to retain. If you take most of the big preserved pumping stations and the railways and all these types of places, most of the volunteers are really quite old and they're struggling. Um, but there's no one young. There's no one coming up behind them. Uh, that's the sad thing. And if we can't, if we are not able as a community, as, as a society, if we, can't, if we can't make a connection with a young generation, I fear for, for a lot of it. Um. When you come to retire, are you going to wander down to your local wind or water mill and say, I'm here? <laughs> if, they, if, they, if they end up seeing this film, <laughs> they're probably going to laugh because we've had that discussion many, many, many times. <laughs> they, have, they have actually said to me, would I become their resident volunteer miller or mill ride, I should say, because they, they do have lots of fantastic um, milling volunteers there. I can't imagine a time not mill writing. I can't imagine a time not practicing what I love to do. Equally, I can't manage a time retiring. Um, I don't have any, um, any ambitions to retire whatsoever. I will be forced to retire at some point. Um, uh, so yes, I can imagine myself um, volunteer mill writing somewhere. Nutterley Post Mill is a small post mill on the edge of Ashdown Forest in East Sussex. It's first seen on a map around 1836 and is one of only five remaining open trestle post mills in the country. In 2018, 
The cross trees of the supporting trestle were found to be rotten at the ends. Well, you need to bring a strap this side now. And repairs were commenced by the team of volunteers. The mill was supported by heavy timbers and acro poles to take the 21 odd tons so that a new end could be scarfed into the cross tree. This joint, a bird's mouth joint, stops the quarter bars sliding on the cross trees. The original joints were developed centuries ago in the timber framed buildings of the time and adapted for use in mills. Once some extra trimming was completed and wood treatment applied, finally the new and old could be joined together and the trestle complete again. This is just one small example of how a team of skilled volunteers can successfully look after a mill and this can be seen in mills up and down the country. Can I just ask really why you want to use volunteers on Nutley Mill rather than go and use a millwright? The problem with millwrights is they have got to make a profit, whereas volunteers, providing they're expert volunteers, with you, you know, all the all the carpenters we had there have had many years of experience, but they retired, so it doesn't matter how long you take. The thing is, while you're working there, visitors like to see you working there. So if it's um, if you take longer, then it doesn't matter too much because the visitors can see they don't appreciate that you, you're taking a long time, and um, so you can attract more visitors uh, when you're actually working on a mill. It being a sort of a charity that's pretty much funded by donations, you want to make as much use or good use of the money that we can against that of course it does mean that all these projects do take a long time is there sort of like a, a regular maintenance schedule or i think it more or less the mill more or less tells you what it wants wants doing it's almost a living structure really, isn't it it does you know we discovered that it needed to have its head sickness sorted out by the fact that it was making it quite obvious it needed some work doing to it the, the, the main problem we've got is that um, you've got a team of keen carpenters and they like to be busy all the time. Because ours is probably the oldest one in the country, we want to um, uh, leave as much of the old stuff as we can. Whereas many mills are, are restored and they look more or less brand new. It's obviously changed over the years. Um, what sort of changes has the mill um, had on it? Originally, it would just had it would have had just the brake wheel, I think, and that would have worked to a much smaller millstone. I believe um, about a two foot six diameter millstone, and the mill was um, hadn't had the extension built on the back of it. So the stairs that go up at the moment. Um, I put the side, I think must have gone across across the mill in those days. Do you think these improvements uh, were easy to do at the mill? I don't think they were, no. Um, because they had to fit out. They, um, they changed from being a, um, a wooden being shaft to being an iron one. And I think that was probably when they decided to extend the mill to fit the uh, iron wind shaft in. When you um, took the sails off and when you've put the sails back on and again with the stocks, you've done it in a more traditional way. Was that intentional and broadening out? Is that the way you prefer to do things in a, a more traditional way? Yeah, I much prefer to do it the old way. Um, it takes a lot longer. It, it, it took us about um, nine months to replace the stocks. Um, but bearing in mind that it's only one day a week, so, so it's uh, only about 40 or 50 
actually working days in that nine months. It, but uh, this is the beauty of having uh, retired people doing it. We, do, we can take long and it doesn't matter. A lot of mills, uh, even recently, have lost their sales uh, in a storm. And uh, I felt after 40 odd years, they were about 45 years old, I felt that if we didn't do it now, then, well, I've got a um, reasonably active group of, of uh, carpenters to do it, we might leave it too late. And uh, we, we would then, we would have had to have uh, millwrights build it. And uh, it wasn't until we, we actually took it all apart that we found how, how decayed the, uh, the timber work was. Yes, particularly with the common sails, as in uh, or common sweeps, as in the when you need to set the sail canvas, you do actually climb up the uh, structure, so you do need it to be <laughs> sound and uh, safe and secure. Yeah. The ultimate thing is you've got to preserve the building for the future. And now for a flight over Bocking Windmill. The mill, which was first built in 1721, has recently had a fresh coat of paint and is looking splendid. In 1989, the Friends of Bocking Windmill and Braintree District Council collaborated on restoration projects and the mill has undergone restoration and repairs regularly over the years to allow future generations to enjoy the history of the mill. Unfortunately this year, the mill suffered a setback in February when it sustained some damage during the storms, resulting in a third of one of the sails snapping off. Let's hope it's soon back to form. Coming up, we talk to Tim Whiting, the Suffolk millwright, and have a virtual tour of his works, and an unusual mill in Oxfordshire. But first, the bald explorer, Richard Vobes, takes us around Alden Mill in Sussex. Behind me, we have a terrific, wonderful object that I'm going to explore today. And Fred Maladay is the gentleman standing next to me who's going to tell me all about it. And you are part of the Oldlands Mill Trust. Correct. I'm chairman of the Oldlands Mill Trust at the moment. It's yes. very nice to meet you, uh, Fred. Thank you so much for inviting us to your wonderful uh, windmill. This windmill that we're standing in front of, we're going to have a look round shortly, is quite old. Yes, the first evidence is in 1703, um, so we assume it was real, let's say 1700. Worked commercially right through to 1912, Gosh. when it was abandoned, as many mills were in those days, of course, when these newfangled steam engines came yes, along and indeed. rather took over the grinding business. But steam did have a connection with this mill. Oh yes indeed, uh, in common with most mills at that time it was actually converted so that you could use an external engine drive to actually power the stones and we'll see evidence of that later on. It's a post mill. And probably the most common in the south of England because of course they're almost entirely constructed of wood. We had plenty of timber in the south of England, rather less yes. stone and brick. They tended to build more tower mills as you move further north. How long has the, the trust been looking after the windmill? Well, it ceased working, as I've said, in 1912. Um, it was basically left to rot and rust quietly until we get through to 1980, when the local authority quite reasonably pointed out it was about to collapse. It was right. a dangerous building. Gosh. Therefore, it had to be either seriously restored or abandoned. Yes. And yes. it commenced in 1980, the actual restoration. Wow. Well, I think it's time that we went and had a look in more detail at this wonderful windmill. So, Fred. Can you lead the way? By all means, certainly. The first thing 
that you notice or I notice is we're swaying like in a ship. Mm. And that's normal, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I just thought very I gently, check. very gently. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so what part of the windmill are we in? This is the bin floor, B-I-N, the bins. So the grain is hauled up here. It's brought, brought by the farmers and everybody else by, in those days, horse and cart or whatever, dumped down at the bottom and then hauled up. Hauled up by wind power. We still use the wind power. It'll be brought up to just below where we're standing and then the bag's taken off the hook and simply tipped into one of the three bins we have which, up here. Which are over here in front of us. What uh, floor is this, Fred? This is the stone floor. The stone floor. Weaving our way around. Because of course it contains stones. Here you can see the top stone exposed. It of course is the top stone that rotates. The lower stone is fixed to the floor, hence you get the relative movement. Um, the top stone is of course driven by the brake wheel as it's called, which is also a drive wheel, and that wheel is connected to the wind shaft, the massive wind shaft just above our heads here. And that's the, the, uh, the sail, the wind hits the sweeps which drives the wind shaft. Precisely, yes. The, the wind shaft here, just point this out, because I've seen ones that are made of wood, but this is a cast this iron. Is hollow one. cast oh, iron right. wind shaft which went in around the, um, would have been about the 1870s, something like that. Uh, cast locally, it's got the Phoenix Foundry in Lewis cast into it. In those days, we actually had foundries in Sussex, of course, to do yeah. this sort of thing. Very common replacement in mills because it's the wind shaft, which is in some ways the weakest element within a mill because of the fact that timber dislikes torsion. There's no real timbers that can withstand very high torsional right. loads, that is twisting loads. Yes. And of course the wind shaft is subjected to twisting. Absolutely. And this is an, the original post. Thus, we believe this is the original post, yes. With um, fascinating bits of graffiti, the names of the millers and mm. various other associates. Now there's one bit that's the oldest you found. The oldest we found on here is 1839. Joseph Winchester, October 1839, is cut into there. Gosh. So, we are, Fred, sitting in the roundhouse, where all the bricks have now been beautifully restored and you've got um, bits and bobs on the walls behind us. And <clears throat> I suppose we haven't really said too much about the trestle, and the trestle is this, it's like a tripod, isn't it, that's holding mm. the, the post in position. So much engineering in this for something that was built so long ago, originally thought out. Just briefly, though, towards the end of the mill's life, when steam power came in, it was an option for millers to use that, harness that power, and you still have a drive, what do you call it, a drive ring? A drive pulley, pulley on the outside on and the a outside. lay shaft coming in to connect to the stones. Fred, thank you for taking me and the lovely viewers around. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, pleasure. Thank you very much. This tower mill in Oxfordshire dates from the late 17th century and has the unusual distinction of having two inbuilt fireplaces. Apparently, the lee side fireplace was normally used, but today none are. It must have been quite pleasant inside the mill on a cold winter's day with a fire going, but also quite dangerous with all the flower dust. The mill itself has three storeys and originally had four sails turning clockwise. However, in the later part of its working life, it had only two common sails. The Wheatley Windmill Restoration Society was formed in 1976, the impetus coming from a local man, Will Foreman, who visited the mill whilst researching his book on Oxfordshire mills. Now the mill has been fully preserved, and in 2012 it ground flour for the first time in a hundred years, occasionally grinding flour now for local demonstrations.
So, my name is Tim Whiting, and uh, I'm fairly well known locally as the Suffolk Millwright, although my business name is TWCM Woodworking. We've been working on all sorts of interesting um, timber frame projects for over 20 years, but for the last 10 years, uh, I've been working basically uh, nearly 100% just on windmills, and that was thanks to um, being involved with Vincent Pargeter, uh, who contacted me originally uh, with uh, regards to working on Thorpe Ness windmill um, in Suffolk, which was very close to my workshop. The Thorpe Ness windmill, um, Vincent called in to see me because he was driving past our workshop, which was at Friston windmill. So you can understand uh, how it all happened. And then it wasn't very long before Vincent was asking me to do all sorts of bits and bobs. So I, I had met Vincent um, many years before, back in 2005. But uh, this was the first actual um, chance I got to work with Vincent, literally uh, hands-on uh, as, a, as an apprentice, I suppose, even though I'd been a woodworker for quite a few years beforehand. You mentioned that when you were a woodworker, people were very cagey about the way they worked, whereas millwrights were very open. That's right. I can clearly remember my first... Um, visit to Vincent's workshop and we were working there and, and someone phoned up and he spent quite a bit of time, uh, nearly an hour on the phone to these um, people explaining how to do all the different various things that they'd asked. Whereas from the world I'd come from, you wouldn't have told them any of that. You'd have, you'd have uh, tried to gain work from it. Um, it's the, the windmill world is, is much more open and much more friendly and much more um, helpful to, to people uh, who own windmills and also other people who repair windmills. What does it feel like to sort of actually work work on a mill? It's a very strange uh, experience working on mills because uh, depending on the mill you're at, so, some of the mills have this instant feel of masses of history. When you walk into these buildings, some of them you just know but it's been a massive central hub of the village or the town or the, the environment, and you can feel the hustle and bustle of um, where people were in the past. Um, each mill has a different feel about it, but you've got to remember, when you turn up at a windmill, you're, you're actually dealing with a national monument. It's, it's not just um, someone's piece of property. You're not going into someone's bungalow to put a, uh, a new kitchen in. You're turning up to a, a village centre and you'll normally find that most of the village are very, very uh, up to date with the mill and they're all very caring of the mill. It's a very important building. They really have to be not only uh, maintained, but maintained right. Is there a particular mill or water mill that you really like working on? Many of them realise that we spent about three years restoring Horsey the National Trust. So that always feels like going home for me because I pretty much live there. I, I think it's down to how much work you've done on that mill. All the mills we look after, but um, wind and water mills, uh, wind mills especially, for instance, will need regular painting. They need to be, if they're working, they need to be maintained and greased and lubricated often. Um, there's all sorts of different things that need to be um, watched and made sure. Most mills, uh, even if they're not open to public, quite often are in a, an area where public are around them. Um, I can give you an example of Rayleigh wi a Windmill in Essex. Um, you can't necessarily go up and inside it, but its sails span out over a public car park. So everything has to be in good order all the time and constantly maintained. Um, a lot of money is required to look after a mill constantly. Do you see um, a difference between the traditional millwright, maybe the one who was 200 years ago, and what you're doing today? In some ways, we're very, very similar to traditional millwrights. And in other ways, things are getting much, much more harder to do. Um, there are so many laws now on health and safety and how we work as a, as a group of people um, and how you would try and uh, attempt something. Now, how we work now is, for instance, if you were taking a set of sails off a mill, 
you couldn't just rock up there with your um, saw and a, and a rope and just uh, cut them and lower them down. Um, there would have to be risk assessments and, and method statements put into place and you'd have to explain the, how you're going to take them down and why you're taking them down that way. So, for instance, um, if, you're, if you're working on, on something, and we, we do a lot of rope work, we do a lot of uh, rope access work, but you have to explain why you would use the rope access work and not a cherry picker. Whereas back in the, back in the old days, it would just be a thermos flask and a pack lunch box. So everything changes. Do you find that it is mostly a man's game, mill writing? It does seem to be very much like a man's game, uh, but there's absolutely no reason for it at all. Generally, I find, especially with, uh, where, where there's details involved, like uh, the painting side of things, um, ladies really do tend to do a better job on the painting than the chaps do. I really would like to see more more uh, ladies working in the, in the real world. We we, um, uh, we do have had a few people. My wife at the moment does most of our painting work. She's been heavily involved with uh, all sorts of aspects of the, of the real work. But uh, for some reason, the second the mill rocks out on the side, it seems to be the boys. The last mill we've worked on in here has been Chillenden uh, Post Mill for Kent County Council. So it was a complete uh, dismantle of the sail frames and rebuild. So uh, that was our last one in here. I smile, Steve, you're on camera. <laughs> so this is, uh, as you see, some more, more racking here, uh, and this is uh, our machine shop. So here you can see we've got um, various shackles all being made up, ready for Saxe to Green post mill. These, are, these should be going on at any point, or any point now, really. This is where most people tend to stand from by the fire. Um, it's gloriously uh, warm. Um, that's Sipsy sales. Um, these are now stood here. We don't know yet from English heritage whether they're going to be completely restored or firewood. I'm sure we'll find out in due, to, due time. There are all sorts of, uh, of issues on them uh, that need to be um, gone through. I'm pretty sure some of them are definitely going to be um, replaced. And these are Chillenden's sales. So. These have been through the Dartford Tunnel, and uh, you can see the stocks, the stocks here. Um, as I said earlier on, the biggest project to date we've, we've done would be the uh, restoration of Horsey Wind Pump. Uh, and sadly, although she's been winding beautifully, um, all of a sudden uh, it had an area of damage occur. You can just see, just see here where it had, uh, it had cracked and, and broken out pieces of the mill casting on the on the worm gear, so we're now about to organise casting a new worm. Bye. Bye. So thanks for watching this year's National Mills Weekend 2020, and we hope you've enjoyed this slightly different event. And also, a big thank you to all our participants who have helped with this programme and of course to you at home for watching. Once this crisis is over, don't forget to visit your local mill and buy some flour for some home baking. And if you're interested in windmills, don't forget that you can check out the latest video, The English Windmill, details coming up. But I'll leave the last word to Rex Wales. When you see a mill, don't think of her just as a pleasant part of the landscape. Think of the thought and devoted craftsmanship that has gone into the designing and building of her and into her upkeep since then.
So thanks for watching and keep safe. Windmills have been part of the British landscape for nearly a thousand years. Their critical role in food production put them at the forefront of technology. And now, with renewed interest in clean energy generation, windmills are again vital to the modern economy. From the earliest post mills to the majestic tower mills, from the inventors like Meikle to the scientists like Smeaton, this is the story of the technological advances and discoveries that enabled wind power to grind our daily bread. With interviews, archive footage and filmed entirely on location, the English windmill celebrates our industrial past and the conservation of our milling heritage. Available now on DVD and download.